Good evening, familia. This is your Trey Collazo, and you're watching and listening to the Bomba Live Found in Translation simulcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Found in Translation, the talk show that attacks truth about politics and today's hottest issues. And Bomba Live is virtual Puerto Rican celebration where we celebrate the character, perseverance, and talents and opinions in the case of tonight of the Puerto Rican community. Again, this is your Trey Collazo. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me introduce my host for tonight's show. Democratic political analyst, un boricua de Aguada, Puerto Rico, baba. Abraham Amoros, Abraham. <laughs> Buenas noches, baba. Buenas noches, mi hermano. Gracias por este, invitarme en tu programa. And saludos to our live audience on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter, as well as our podcast audience on iTunes, Spotify, and all other audio digital platforms. And a special shout out goes out to our radio listeners on WPPM 106.5 in Philadelphia. Hashtag People Powered Media. Qué placer estar con ustedes esta noche. It is a pleasure to be with you, Abraham. And uh, first of all, it's bad enough that your stinking Baltimore Orioles have been spanking my Phillies the last couple of days. You know, you can't spell Orioles without Rio. That's a good Royal <laughs> reference for you. But I got to be reminded of it with all this orange. You know, I'm, a, and I'm black. I'm, but it is also the Flyers colors. So yes. go fly, boys. That's the one sport that's doing decent. Please share this with your friends. We have a wonderful lineup coming up later on in just minutes. We have one of the top journalists in Puerto Rico covering ese fracaso with the Puerto Rican elections. Very important. Our Puerto Rican diaspora stay on top of this, ter- this, uh, this scourge, this attack on the democracy of Puerto Rico. And when unfortunately, could be a preview to come in November for the United the the mainland elections. So we're going to have the great journalist and uh, political analyst from Dir- Directamente de Puerto Rico, Sandra Rodriguez Cotto, join us in a few minutes. And later on the show, I'm going to show y'all how we get down, get it in. We got to have a Musica Urbano, urban Latino culture update. And who better than La Reina Dominicana de TikTok, Dionel Reyes, y La Almonía, our official Musica Urbano correspondent. A lot going on in the urban Latino music world, brother Jolie Randy. Mozart's beefing with uh with Lapis Consciente. I mean, there's a lot going on, brother. I know you have strong opinions on that, but you're so passionate about it. You can't be on that segment. But, of course, we have to talk about the big political news of the moment. Abe, I wanted to get your take, first of all, mm-hmm. on the biggest news of the week, obviously, which is Vice President and Democratic Presidential nominee Joe Biden endorse, uh, nominating California Senator and former presidential candidate known right. Kamala Harris to be his vice president on nominee. Mm-hmm. So first of all, I got a lot of questions for you, but just give us your opening thoughts about how this uh, impacts the race and your overall thoughts on the, on the nomination. Senator Kamala Harris is going to be a terrific addition to this ticket, representing hope, representing change, representing the future. And while traditionally vice presidential candidates give a slight boost to the presidential candidate, especially in the first two weeks, this race is really about not just 2020, but in the future, a lot of little girls woke up the next day saying to their moms, I can do that. I could be that. A lot of African-American young ladies, a lot of Latinas, a lot of Asian-Americans as well. This is a source of pride for our nation. It should be a source of pride for everybody, not just women, not just women of color, but for everybody, because it represents the necessary hope that we need right now. These are some of the most difficult times in American history. We've got the worst person ever to occupy the White House in navigating and leading us against a virus, against racial strife, against economic uncertainty. Against our post office, Abe. Yeah. I mean, I never thought I'd be living in the richest country in the world and the post office would be attacked. I mean, this is a a civil war from within. That's right. Mano, you you saw what he said today. He basically said... I don't want to give the USPS $25 billion because I know that's going to benefit the Democrats in terms of mail-in voting in the fall. It is outlandish. It is reprehensible. I know I'm tired. I know you're tired. I think our listening audience is tired. Enough of the clown show. Let's get some real adults in the room, some real leadership. Okay, so Ian, you're talking, I'm talking to Abe Ambrose about the Kamala Harris nomination. You know, on a personal level, you know, I mean, she was the favorite, and I'm going to talk about that in a second in a lighter way. But, you know, I, I found myself more, I don't want to say emotional, but more excited about it, genuinely, than I anticipated. Obviously, I was happy when he announced that there would definitely be a woman on the ticket with him. And when it's, it became pretty obvious down the stretch that it was going to be an African-American woman, I was even more satisfied, even though, personally, I would have been happy with, Basically, the only non-black person I probably would be happy with was 
with Elizabeth Warren, frankly. But nevertheless, it was the appropriate pick. Kamala Harris, you know, when you think about vice presidential nominees, there's a few standards that she clearly checked all the boxes and scored the highest, right? Mm -hmm. She was qualified. Could she be president day one? Obviously, this woman ran the largest uh, Justice Department outside the United States in 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 California, Mm -hmm. a strong senator, strong California attorney general, and ran for president and obviously has all the credentials. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, is this someone that sort of complements the top of the ticket? And I think particularly, not only demographically being younger, but the way she can articulate an argument, as she showed uh, about an hour from where you live in Wilmington, Delaware, Abe, yesterday, stating the case, the prosecutor's case against Donald Trump, better than, frankly, Joe can do on most days. Let's keep it real. Yeah, let's keep it real. And and finally, you know, uh, so, so, you know, and someone that compliments him from a policy perspective. So once they get in office, who better to lead the ongoing, not only racial healing, but the 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 the, the cleaning up of our Justice Department we have to do, the cleaning up, you know, the 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 implementation of some real policy that can address that can address uh, racial profiling and the cr- systematic racism in our criminal justice system and some of the domestic issues that Kamala Harris expertise in while Biden can focus on other things, particularly his expertise in foreign affairs and cleaning up our, our presence in the world. Right. And I, and I then was really struck by why, you know, wow, why it was the most, it was a great decision because of the reaction of black women leadership and their particular enthusiasm to, to be acknowledged for the leadership and really being the backbone of the democratic party for all those reasons. And obviously every little thing counts, right? Parents mm-hmm. of immigrants, Caribeña, Papa de Jamaica, eh, para si pana, let's keep it real. Very relatable physically to a lot of Latinos and Latinas. She's from the Bay Area, California. A lot of Latinos are very familiar with her. Got a lot of love for her in that part of the country. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of things. Abe, do you think that, how much do you think she can help? I think the bottom line, you're looking at, you know, potentially a black vote in the South, if it performs particularly high, could cause the blowout, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, the best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Florida, North Carolina, Georgia. Um, but we're talking about three or four urban pockets, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Milwaukee, Columbus, Ohio, Cleveland, Cincinnati, maybe right. that, you know, in the north that could really that could that could solidify this victory for Biden would have would have would have very high uh, Obama level black turnout. Do mm-hmm. you think she could be the key to that? I mean, let's keep it real. She's not the top of the yeah. ticket. Right. And she's not right. Obama either. I mean, let's keep it real. Right. She didn't run the crispest. I mean, it's hard to do. Easy right. for me to say, but. You know, she didn't run the cleanest presidential campaign. It was a little disorganized. And mm-hmm. it was her first time out. It's understandable. Mm-hmm. But oh, how much of a difference do you think she can mean at the end, brother? Well, it's an excitement factor right now that uh, the Democratic Party needs. They need that push. They need that boost. And the electorate is also excited about this nomination simply because of what she brings to the table. You talked about her pedigree. You talked about her education level. You talked about the fact that she was the attorney general in the state of California. So she brings a lot of qualities to the table and she's not afraid to mix it up with anybody. She made Brett Kavanaugh cry. All right, let's keep that real. Yo, she gonna whoop Pence she's going to get, she's going to, she's going to make Pence tear. She's going to work Pence like a rib. He <laughs> is going to walk away. I like that. Also in tears, you know, he's going to be calling her mother when right, these, uh-huh. this debate is over with. She brings a lot of enthusiasm to the table. She brings a lot of uh, cachet and a lot of credibility. Now, let's keep this in mind. Even though she was an unsuccessful primary candidate, so were many other vice presidential candidates. And you know, they're already starting to throw stuff at her, Ralph. Today, the president in a news conference about two hours ago, uh, basically repeated a BS line that she's not qualified to be on the ticket as her parents are immigrants. Come on, man. His mom's an immigrant. Exactly. All his wives were immigrants. Two of the three wives. All the wives, I think. But facts don't get in the way of a good, disgusting argument you, with I Donald you Trump. Some muchacho, brother. El hombre no tiene vergüenza, Stanford mano. professors no tiene and her parents, bro. Stanford mm-hmm. per economic right. and science, respectively. Unbelievable. Right. I want to. I want to have a. We have to have a couple keep it real moments in a second, brother. Yeah. So the first thing is we got to keep it real. You know this was going to be the pick for a long time. I knew it was going to be a pick for a long time. So I want to show a little bit of evidence that would preclude, that will sh- that that gives you a little insight as to how this was baked in the cake. Hold on. Abe, let me ask you a question, brother. Can you hear me, Abe? Yes. 
Okay, let me ask you a question, bro. When you see this picture, well, I mean, the, the, if when Michelle Obama looks at this picture, do you think she thought there was a doubt? Nope. <laughs> so nope. you know, you know, Barack went to the house, and you know, Michelle's like, "Oh, so who Joe gonna pick?" Oh, let me guess. And he was like, "Oh no, brother, hey Michelle, he's vetting twenty five people." 25 people. There wasn't more than four people on the list. Let's keep it right. 20 was able. You vetted for the vice president. There was only two people that were really, I mean, three, uh, Warren early, uh, Susan rice Rice, and and then Campbell. I mean, everybody Mm -hmm. else, nice optics. It's good to give them a little shout out, but that was, Mm -hmm. there's no really else that was in. I think on some level, Biden really wanted to do Susan rice because I think that's, he's the most comfortable with, Mm -hmm. but guess what happened? Yep. The kingmaker made the call, and it was the right call. Susan Rice, first of all, she's got a son that's a Trump supporter. That's bad optics. Benghazi's bad optics. Yeah. She's boring as a stone. So, you know, he picked the right person. We're talking to Abe Ambrose here. We're going to talk in a minute to Sandra Rodriguez Cotto about que está pasando en Puerto Rico, ese fracaso con las elecciones. But the other thing we do want to talk about, a little preview of the Democratic National Convention here on Bomba Live next week, Abe. They will be a small delegation in the hundreds in Milwaukee. I would have been there. You probably would have been there. We all would have been a nice time in Milwaukee. But COVID happens. Yeah. And most of it will be basically an online. It'll basically be like a Bomba Live. It'll be a series of virtual speeches on all platforms. And we'll do a watch party next Thursday and everything else. Mm-hmm. So I guess there's, I have one question for you. And then I got to slap the DNC's hand. Vanessa's waiting for this. And I got to give Vanessa our Zion of progress, our Zion for progressive what she wants, because I got to tell the truth on it. What are your expectations next week, Abe, for the DNC? What should people, and especially Latinos, what should they be listening for next week during the DNC? They should be listening for messages of inclusion, change. They should be listening for any reference that includes Puerto Rico as part of the United States. Well, that would be nice. It would be nice to have Puerto Rican speakers. They have one, and they gave it 60 seconds, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. Right. Now. Just to preempt this discussion a little bit, I understand the frustration. I live the frustration. I have to bite my tongue because uh, I want to come out with a bunch of expletives as to how we continue to be a voting block that gets consistently ignored on a daily basis. We have to pull harder. Keeping it real, Vanessa. But we also have to make sure that we have a seat at the table. Because if we don't have a seat at the table and we're not in the room, then change is not going to take place. So we can be candid. We can, we can speak uh, passionately about our issues. But the bottom line is we have to win in the fall. If we don't win in the fall, then our issues are going to get zero play. If we have four more well, years we'll be, of you this and I will be in jail if we don't win in the fall. Let's keep that real. Bro, I'm, we don't have a democracy if we don't win in the fall. I mean, I'm just, hey. Let's put it on the table, people. folks. All this chit chat. She was a prosecutor and Biden's old. Let's keep it real. This is not mm-hmm. even a discussion. We don't mm-hmm. have. He's trying to destroy the post office. If you mm-hmm. don't care about race and children, the border or black people, if you don't care about none of that or 160 people dying, mm-hmm. you know, 80 percent of Latinos know somebody that got sick. I'm, you know, like, you don't care about none of that. Mm-hmm. Our democracy, our, our community is at stake here, period. Yeah. Our way of life is fundamentally under threat. Absolutely. Preach, brother. I hear you. So, hey, this is the concern, bro. Mm-hmm. So the concern, I heard this from a lot of Latinos last couple of days. Let's keep it real. We're going to keep it three, 151 here on Found Translation Bomb My Life. Mm-hmm. Hey, Kamala, we love her. Qualificada, we we down with Kamala. But then we hear Biden talking about the, the next social, uh, Supreme Court pick being a black female. That's been an issue with black women leadership for a decade because Obama went over two on that one. Put a Puerto Rican in there, Sonia. So, you know, we got I'm that. happy one. with that. We're happy with that, right? And they were too. But, you know, you can understand the frustration. Mm-hmm. So the question Latinos tell me is, well, look, that's nice. Hey, we're down with Kamala and this ain't to say we're, but what what are we going to see when we don't see, obviously, you know, we don't get that spot. Understandable. There wasn't really a Latino, a Latina in particular that was, you know, that had that kind of profile. Let's be honest about it. But we're not seeing any of the, La- the Latino agenda, which was good. I'd put it at a B plus A minus, the Latino agenda he laid out. Had some good platforms. Had very little in Puerto Rico. Let's be honest about that. And then we see a list, Abe, of 35 speakers for the mm-hmm. DNC. Right. And only three Latinos. Actually, three Latinas. There's no guys. Yeah. And and the most prominent Latino politician in the country, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, mm-hmm. El Único Boricua, 
literally get 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're feeling a certain way about that, Abe. So yep. I will say this, fam, to y'all, because and this is when you got to get your, your your notebooks out here. Apunta there. You got to write down these little notes because it's six months later. I'm going to be like, Rafi told me that on, on Bomba Live. Is that there's been a lot of discussions. I want people to know that among the Latino leadership community nationally, there's a lot of discussions around this. So I want you to know, I then throw, Abe talked about quedando callao, that he's he Biden's hearing it, especially from Puerto Ricans on the highest levels because they're falling short here so far on it. Getting better. They're hiring people and all that. So they're getting better. But secondly, that a lot of the other leadership roles, thinking about the cabinet next time around, you know, who could be potentially the head of health and human services is going to be a critical role to get us out of COVID and deal with the racial inequities. Who could be the next attorney general? Going to be a critical role for people of color right. to deal with these issues. I who could... Who could be HUD? I mean, critical position. Who could be the person that takes Kamala Harris's place in the U.S. Senate in the largest Latino state in the country, California, which has never mm -hmm. had a Latino senator? That's right. And you know what, Ralph? I'm glad you brought that up because the Secretary of State in California, Alex Padilla, happens to be a very good friend of the governor of California. I would say the smart money would be him to replace Harris, uh, Senator Harris. But you also have to understand Nobody's going to want to talk about that right now. They don't want to put the cart before the horse. So let's get them to win on November 3rd, and then we can have these discussions. But if I'm a betting man, I think that uh, the governor appoints Alex Padilla because that is a significant voting block. He's from Southern California. It gives the state of California some He looks great well. in a suit, doesn't it? I mean, God, what a <laughs> tall, handsome guy, Alex. Yeah, no, he looks the part. He's very qualified. Some would say that was kind of part of the deal why he didn't run against Gavin Newsom. <laughs> and then, you know, we've got a California attorney general, Javier Becerra, who would be a former yeah, in-house awesome. leadership, would be a fabulous mm -hmm. attorney general, hypothetically. See, so I know our people are frustrated. They're they're anxious. They should be. Particularly, I'm concerned on the policy stuff. You know, Medicare for all didn't make the platform. So there's a lot of battles we have. But I want people to understand that there is mobilization happening. And I encourage people, especially my Boricuas and Latino leaders in Florida and the East Coast, the Pennsylvanians. I know our friends in Pennsylvania are doing a great job mobilizing. We have to continue to hold this administration accountable. We have to put the in the same way we're putting these names for, and I need a Puerto Rican in that cabinet too, bro, like an idiot Velasquez for SBA or somebody of that mm -hmm. ilk, right? Mm -hmm. We need to put the Jones Act on the table. I'm going to keep saying this, Biden people, until you address it. Every mm -hmm. week on the show, I need the Jones Act on the table, and I need the elimination and the timeline for the elimination of the Promesa board on the table. Right. As well as these other issues that we have to mm -hmm. deal with, with our community. You're listening to our political analyst, Democratic strategist, Abe Amoros and, and, and Baltimore Orioles super fan. He's there, he's living in his element. He's having his, uh, his, his uh, the orange and black are back, boy. And we're going to talk a second about the Puerto Rico. But before we get to our very special guest, Sandra Rodriguez Cotto, to talk about fracaso in Puerto Rico, we're going to listen to a group that appeared on Bomba Live a few weeks ago. A group, A, what great guys these guys are. They're a group called La Palcha, que se llama La Palcha de Salinas, Puerto Rico, a town one of my, many of my cousins grew up in. And they combine. Los ritmos de Puerto Rico, pop, baladas y la música de Colombia, brother, cumbia, vallenato. Really? So real great guys. So we're going to play a clip of their, of their newest video. And then you're going, to, we're, you're going to have the honor of introducing Sandro Rodriguez Cotto on Bomba Live. Hay amores que no pasan de una noche. Aparecen y se pierden como gotas en el mar Hay amores en silencio que se esconden Por creer que es un pecado amar en plena libertad Yo tengo suerte de tenerte en esta vida De que sales cada herida con los besos que me das Porque este amor me devolvió la luz del sol me ha llenado el corazón de primavera Y tantas ilusiones nuevas Este amor que me salvó en la soledad Sin condiciones para dar la vida entera No es dar de mil maneras tanto amor Mil maneras voy a adorarte Me quedo corto y no podré pagarte Estaba perdida y me encontraste Con esta luz de tus ojos al mirarme Ya no quiero a nadie más 
este amor Me devolvió la luz del sol Y me ha llenado el corazón de primavera Y tantas ilusiones nuevas Este amor que me salvó en la soledad Sin condiciones para dar la vida entera Yo voy a estar de mil maneras tanto amor Thank you, our friends in La Pacha, and uh, I'm sure we'll be having back on the show. Those guys are, are on for great success. Thank you for watching the Bomba Live and Found Translation Simulcast. Y ahora, en este segmento de Bomba Live, vamos a hacer una entrevista con a very special guest about a, a, a subject very important to us and very important to our democracy, el fracaso que está pasando en Puerto Rico. Y Abraham, you have the pleasure of introducing our very special guest. Sí, muchas gracias por estar presente con nosotros, Sandra Rodríguez Coto, la bienvenida. Y un poquito de antecedente en términos de lo que está pasando en la isla. El Estado Libre Asociado de Puerto Rico tiene 78 municipios. Municipio. La semana pasada ocurrió la elección de la primaria y hubo un fracaso, fíjate, porque hay 110 precintos en Puerto Rico y lamentablemente 40% de esos precintos no recibieron las papeletas. Entonces tuvieron que cancelar eh, eh, la elección fueron un montón de demandas eh, eh, que ocurrieron y el, la Corte Suprema de Puerto Rico eh, decidió detener el, el, el resto de la elección este fin de semana. Así que queremos hablar con Sandra para saber lo que pasó. Y bienvenida Sandra Rodríguez Coto y gracias por estar con nosotros esta noche. Y vamos a empezar contigo. ¿Qué pasó la semana pasada y qué va a suceder este fin de semana? Gracias por la invitación. Es un honor para mí estar con ustedes aquí. ¿Qué pasó? El resultado del caos que vive Puerto Rico, los recortes que ha impuesto la Junta de Control Fiscal la, el, bajo la ley promesa y también eh, la, el hecho de que se ha nombrado mucha gente que no tiene experiencia, que responden a los intereses partidistas, no necesariamente a los intereses de, del pueblo y cada uno en sus intereses, gente sin experiencia, hicieron una enmienda, una reforma electoral cuatro meses antes de las elecciones y todo ha sucedido a la misma vez. La gente que tenía experiencia la sacaron de la Comisión Estatal de Elecciones. Y aquí ha habido pues mucha polémica, mucha, eh, mucho lío. Eh, desde, desde, el, desde el principio hubo señalamientos, por lo menos en la primaria, hay, hubo dos primarias, la primaria del, del Partido Nuevo Progresista y la, la primaria del Partido Popular Democrático. Así que eh, desde el principio hubo confrontación, hubo problemas desde el voto adelantado a los presos y el voto, lo que le llaman los encamados, la gente que no se puede levantar. Así que hay mucha dificultad. El tribunal determinó que se va a hacer este próximo fin de semana nuevamente, que se supone que la, los votos que se emitieron no se, eh, se van a contar, pero no se va a decir hasta las 4 de la tarde de este fin de, del domingo. Eh, y por lo menos ahí se le garantiza el voto a los que emitieron el voto, pero uno no sabe cuál fue la, la custodia, cómo se custodió ese, ese material, porque eh, desde el primer momento había gente tomándole fotografías a las, a las boletas, a las mismas papeletas, lo ponía en las redes sociales, lo mandaba por WhatsApp. O sea que hay, hay mucha controversia en cuanto a esto. Y yo creo que lo más importante es que, la, fíjate que el, los jueces del, del Supremo hacen unas declaraciones bien, bien específicamente la presidenta del, del tribunal, muy fuertes en contra de los comisionados electorales del Partido Popular y del Partido Nuevo Progresista, y poco falta para decirle inepto al presidente de la comisión. Pero entonces, les deja a ellos tomar las decisiones de lo que va a pasar el domingo. ¿En qué estamos? Pues estamos en las mismas. Es, es una pena, se había hablado de una posibilidad de que se extendieran las elecciones, se aplazaran, o sea, to postpone the elections for later on in the year, pero la sí. gente no, eso sí que causaría polémicas. Así que yo creo que hay muchas cosas, eh, la renuncia inmediata del presidente de la Comisión Estatal de Elecciones, que dijo que se iba a ir y después dijo que no, no sabe cuánto, eh, procesos, procesamientos criminales que podría haber en, en contra incluso de los dos presidentes de los partidos, Partido Popular y Partido Nuevo Progresista. Sí. ¿Por qué? Porque ellos se asu asumieron un control a la, y ellos hicieron una conferencia de prensa porque vieron que los comisionados electorales no estaban haciendo nada 
y dijeron, vamos a dejarlo para el próximo fin de semana. Ellos no tenían derecho en ley para hacer ese tipo de, de postura, porque se supone que eso lo asumiera el comisionado electoral, pero me, me da la impresión, y por lo que yo he escuchado hasta ahora, es que ellos veían que estaba pasando el tiempo y no tomaban decisiones, y, y crecía esta, esta desinformación, los, casi todos los pueblos del sur de Puerto Rico no recibieron las papeletas, la gente llegaba, sobre todo los viejitos que siempre votan por los partidos políticos, oh, sí. llevaban bien temprano a hacer fila y no había nada, no llegaban los materiales y después dijeron que era a las 11 de la mañana, no llegaron. Así que, que hay muchas, eh, muchas preguntas por contestar y el, la preocupación grande es que si esto pasó ahora, ¿qué, padri, ¿qué podría pasar de aquí a las elecciones? Es un proceso más grande, que hay, es más complejo porque hay más partidos políticos también. Así uh -huh. que yo creo que eh, hubo una serie de casos que se plantearon, la ACLU demandó el uh -huh. Partido Popular, dos candidatos del Partido Popular, el candidato del Partido Nuevo Progresista, la gobernadora también. Así que yo creo que el gobierno, el tribunal trató de hacer una decisión salomónica. Uh -huh. Pero... Todavía quedan las interrogantes. Los critica, pero son ellos los que tienen que estar administrando el proceso. Bueno, me imagino también que los candidatos deben estar muy frustrados con el proceso y lo que sucedió la semana pasada. ¿Qué están hablando ellos? ¿De, de quién están hablando en este momento sobre las elecciones? Mira, lo que pasa es que estas elecciones han sido bien diferentes. En estas elecciones no ha habido campaña, porque estamos en el COVID. Sí. La campaña ha venido a comenzar realmente la última semana, en los, por lo menos en la televisión, Tú no oyes las caravanas como antes. Esto ha venido los últimos días, es, es, realmente porque la gente eh, estaba encerrada. Tú no ves espacios en los medios de comunicación, en los canales de, de, de televisión, a los, a los partidos nuevos, a los partidos minoritarios, prácticamente no los ves. Siempre está el rojo y el azul. A uh -huh. veces el verde, el independentista, pero Victoria Ciudadana. Hay un candidato independiente a la gobernación. Hay el Partido Dignidad, que es un partido conservador, de muchos religiosos, tampoco está allá afuera. O sea, que no ha habido la, la, la exposición que uno hubiese esperado en, o que hubiese sido tradicional en unas elecciones precisamente por la contienda. Quien más se exponía era la gobernadora porque hacía las conferencias de prensa de COVID. Uh -huh. Y un poco la alcaldesa de San Juan. Uh -huh. Pero las, las encuestas desde el principio decía que esto estaba muy reñido, por lo menos en el Partido Popular, bien reñido entre el alcalde de Isabela y el, y el expresidente del Senado, el senador Eduardo Batia. Uno, un, más o menos un mes y medio antes yo tuve acceso a, a tres, tres encuestas distintas que los ponían a la par y ya ponían al alcalde de Isabela al frente. Después vi un cambio y Batia subió, pero este, eso ha ido variando. Eh, uh -huh. Obviamente en estas primarias la gente piensa que como el alcalde de Isabela es un pueblo pequeño, fuera de San Juan, pues la gente, tú sabes que en Puerto Rico hay prejuicios, dicen los de la isla, como si no fuese San Juan, como si fue, Puerto Rico no fuera una isla. Sí. Pues yo creo que ha habido una sorpresa, hay un poco de desgaste, ven al, al alcalde de Isabela como una persona un, distinta, a, aunque él ha estado en el Partido Popular por años, fue vicepresidente, pero lo ven como alguien distinto al establishment. Eh, uh -huh. Hay un gran sector que, que lo ve así. Pero a la misma vez hay un, un sector que no lo reconoce porque él no ha sido consistente en postura. Él dijo que era eh, eh, creía la, que él no era soberanista, después dijo que sí lo era. Ha estado cambiando de, de posiciones, además de que administrar un municipio como Isabela, Isabela es más, el, el presupuesto de Isabela es como 10 veces menor que la, la agencia más pequeña del gobierno. O sea, él no te, él, le hablan que él tiene... Eh, experiencia administrativa, pero realmente no es comparable con una agencia, por ejemplo, el Departamento de Educación es como 90 veces más grande el presupuesto que el de Isabela, así sí. que más aproximadamente. Entonces Batia estaba muy cercano, aparentemente en las elecciones del sábado Batia iba al frente o ellos pensaban que iba al frente y la situación cambió, así que no te sé decir cuál de los dos va a ganar, uh -huh. todo tiende a indicar que el de Isabela podría dar la sorpresa. Uh -huh. En el PNP yo no tengo la menor duda que va a ganar Pedro Pierluisi. Mm. No, va, bueno, no va a ganar la gobernadora. Vamos a hablar un poquito en inglés también, porque yo quiero saber yeah. eh, tu opinión acerca de dos cosas. Do you think people are going to come out to, to, to vote this weekend because they're frustrated? And secondly, who do you think is going to come out victorious? And I just want to editorialize one minute here. We have been, Puerto Rico has been a model in terms of elections in the past 
50, 60 years. Latin American countries have looked at our system as being efficient, as being productive. And so this sets us back a little bit. But in your opinion, first of all, how is the community responding? Who do you think is going to come out on top? And can we reestablish that credibility? I'm not sure if we're going to be able to reestablish the credibility for this election electoral cycle because I think we're too late into the cycle. The uh, laws has to be amended. Some people are calling to go back to the previous law, which was the one that was uh, applauded by all the other countries and all the uh, yeah. observatories that came to Puerto Rico in, in, in the past. So I'm not sure that's going to happen. In terms of these primaries, um, I think people were really upset. Remember that most of the people that go to work to vote for a primary um, are what we call a corazón de rollo, the fanatics, the people that are really uh, very strong supporters of their own po po political party. So those people are going to vote anywhere, anyway, whether it's tomorrow or, I mean, in, in two weeks, they, they, will, they will go. So um, they were expecting that, that uh, in this election, this primary, the amount of voters were going to go down. Usually it's about uh, 400,000 that they were going to go, uh, they were estimating between 100,000 and 200,000, 200, 250, 250 some, somewhere like that. So I think um, it might not increase the amount of people. As a matter of fact, I think less people might show up simply because of the COVID and the statistics and what is going on with the COVID. The governor is expecting to, people are expecting to have a, a probably we will go back to the, 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 the first stage of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back to that probably on Monday. Oh. So I, I don't, I mean, uh, a doctor, the fifth doctor that passed away died today. There are a lot of people that are getting uh, sick, so I, I, there's a, a real concern about that. So I'm not sure if, if a lot of people are going to show up. I think they're going to remain more or less the same amount of, of voters. And we're talking to uh, Puerto Rican uh, island-based reporter, political analyst, uh, Sandra Rodriguez Cotto here on Bomba Live about the Puerto Rico election. Sandra, I have a, a question for you. You know, amongst, generally speaking, uh, Puerto Ricans, the diaspora, and Latinos around the country generally have a very favorable opinion of San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín. And she has a, a particularly in the progressive space with younger Latinos, you know, kind of like a lot of people connected to that relate to Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders. And that movement also are very con feel very strong about Carmen Yulín, especially with Latinos outside the Puerto Rican community, to be honest with you. But in the Puerto Rican community, generally speaking. She she's not very popular. Doesn't seem like she's very popular in Puerto Rico. Can you help us to understand why? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have obviously, uh, you know, we can speculate, but you're on the island, and I know she has some support, but nobody expects her to win Sunday. So, can you just give us a sense of of why she has this 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 uh, this very different brand on the island as it compared to Latinos in the United States in the mainland? There's even a rumor that she might uh, quit and she will support Badia. Batia's campaign. That's what people are saying. That, that that rumor has started today, so, you know, you never know. Nunca but uh, there's some um, sexism is one of the main reasons. And um, even though we had we had a female governor before, Sila Calderon, Seguro. she had to face, she faced a lot of, uh, of anger. People are, there's a, there's still machismo in Puerto Rico. That's, that's part of politics. But also in terms of uh, Carmen Yulín, her her behavior and more more important her I mean if you go to and you see the city of San Juan it, it's basically it looks worse than with the previous mayor I mean it's completely some of the streets are completely dirty uh, in, in, and she hasn't done much in terms of public works for the for the people of San Juan and also the uh, employees in, in the in the San Juan municipality are really they they see that her style, her administrative style, she's very tough, and people don't like that here in Puerto Rico. Mm. So I think Where that we heard that before about women candidates, mm. political figures. Yeah. Pero sabes qué? In terms of her, I think I think uh, people recognize when and a lot of people uh, get to know her in the states when she went after Trump and she criticized Trump after the hurricane, which was 
you know, it was true that what, what she said was very important. Nobody in the government was doing. When she was defending the public, our governor was basically, you know, following president and, and allowed the president to throw us a paper towel at, at us. But um, then you see what's going on in San Juan and what happens in San Juan. And, and when you see the, the way the city looks, it's really, it looks, it, it's, there are some areas in San Juan, which is the capital city, that looks completely destroyed. And that's the sole responsibility of the mayor. So she has not been a good mayor in, in that in re regard. And that's why people don't like her. That's and also, yeah. I would say also her strong support for the LB, LB it, it, this is very interesting because um, people in Puerto Rico tend to be progressive and respect the LGBT community, but they don't want politicians to keep talking about that all the time. And I think uh, uh, Julie has been very, you know, a vocal defending that uh, population. And, and some people don't like that. And also, I mean, she has many detractors, even in her, in her own party, to be honest. So that's it's a combination of... of well, people. also the, the suspicion that she's... The corazón independentista, and there's a lot of those dynamics, right? Ideological dynamics. Bueno, este es soberanista, soberanista. Mm -hmm. seguro, seguro. So, so the so the one of the things that I think is going to be interesting, and we'll see what happens Sunday, right? Like, so if it's Beluisi, Batia, you know, we'll see, right? Is that there's definitely a, a definitely a sense that there needs to be change in Puerto Rico, and obviously, I mean, the PNP brand couldn't have gone through a worse, you know, and then yeah. Wanda's reaction. She's washing her hands of this. Jennifer Gonzalez is saying she's not part of the administration. All this ridiculousness. Um, but nevertheless, it, it feels, and I could be wrong, Sandra. I want you to educate me on this. Is that these new parties and these new political figures, Alexander Lugaro, um, Eliezo Gonzalez, the 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 PP uh, candidate is is a strong candidate, regardless of how you feel about it. He's Dalma is a str generally considered a strong candidate the most, the many, um, and some of these other. I almost feel like that's going to help the PNP because they have that very strong base that 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 um, that Tomas Rivera chats sort of who arguably the most powerful political figure on the island, the president of the party and and the Senate president um, holds on to. So, how do you see? Is it possible any of these third parties could could win or do stronger, or will that ultimately help the PNP with the with dividing the vote as it did the last time with Rosio winning? The last time, uh, I think Alexandra Lugaro became she turned she she became the third political uh, you know uh, elected official or uh, not elected but uh, she got into third position and uh, basically she affected all the parties particularly the the Popular Democratic Party Stay because well. they lost for you know Rosario won for less than two percent of the entire vote so votes were divided. I don't think that's going to happen this time because of our previous experience. Yet, yet uh, there's a sense of there's a silence uh, within voters, and you have we haven't seen that many uh, uh, surveys and, and polls published by the local newspapers that they that, uh, like they used to do in, in regular uh, campaign trails. So I don't think uh, you know that that has to do with that. But also, if you ask me. I will say uh, people are, you know, I don't know. It just we have to think what happened during last summer, the protests of summer of night of 2019. Uh, people from different parties were completely upset with with the governor, and I think that's going to continue, and we're going to see some surprises during the, the elections. Yet mm -hmm. I don't think they're at the end of the at the end of when they go to the ballot, they, they might think if I go, if I give my vote to a, an alternative party that might divide what happened. It all, it's, it's all going to depend on who are going to win the primaries. Mm. ¿Y cuál es su predicción para este fin de semana? Uepa, la Lola. That's what I want to hear. Come on. Come on, Sandra. Bueno, yo, no, yo te puedo decir, es que todavía <laughs> creo que, que para el Partido Popular, Charlie Delgado tiene muchas posibilidades. Seguro. Tiene muchas posibilidades, este, pero no sabemos, porque Batia apela a un sector de los estadistas y a, un, y a muchos populares que pueden decir, espérate, Charlie o Batia, ¿sabes? todavía es muy cercano. Te digo que en el PNP creo que Wanda Vázquez no va a ganar porque hay mucho descontento con lo que ha pasado con el gobierno. O sea, estoy, no estoy segura con el Partido Popular. 
estoy de acuerdo. Una... En el Partido Popular, por más que digan, porque han salido algunas cosas de Charlie Delgado que tiene, se alega que tiene vínculos con Elías Sánchez y algunos miembros del, del grupo de los del chat de, de Rosselló. Entonces, yo no sé si es cierto, pero eso es una alegación, un comentario que está en la calle de los últimos días. Así que no sé qué va a pasar en, en torno a eso. Hay que ver cómo va a salir, pero yo no, no, no creo que la, la gente se vaya a activar para este fin de semana más de lo que se pensaba para el anterior. Ahí Sam, uh -huh. Sandra, ¿qué es un mensaje? We have a lot of Puerto Ricans watching from the diaspora de Florida, Tampa, obviamente, todo parte de Florida. Abe and I, we're up here in Pennsylvania, the Northeast, New York, all over the country, all over the world. I got cousins que están en Japón watching on, in the military. Um, ¿Qué es un mensaje a la diáspora? Es de, de parte de que está pasando en Puerto Rico. I mean, obviously, besides the elections, o terremotes, I mean, there's earthquakes, the earthquakes are still happening, the, the crisis económica, la pandemia. ¿Qué es un, what should we be understand about and how can we support what's happening in Puerto Rico con lo, la familia de nosotros que tenemos en la isla? Tiene que estar pendiente. Tiene que llamar, tiene que estar pendiente. Nosotros, fíjate, y esto es un mensaje que quiero dar. Por muchos años, la gente en Puerto Rico no estaba pendiente a la diáspora. Por años se fomentaba la separación entre Puerto Rico y Estados Unidos. Y le decían los New Yorkers, aunque vivieran en Pensilvania. Pero eso ha ido variando. Hay más puertorriqueños fuera de la isla que en la isla. Así que es importante que entendamos que el pueblo puertorriqueño, tú eres puertorriqueño donde quiera que estés. Y se demostró durante el huracán María el rol tan importante que tiene la diáspora en apoyarnos, en entendernos, en, en tratar de, de resolver nuestras situaciones. Yo creo que el futuro de Puerto Rico necesita de la diáspora, necesita de los puertorriqueños que están afuera para ayudarnos a levantarnos de, de, de lo que estamos pasando. Puerto Rico está pasando por momentos muy difíciles. Créeme que no es fácil estar aquí. Nosotros llevamos más de 10 años de una depresión económica, tenemos una junta de control fiscal, ten hemos tenido el huracán María, todavía hay personas con toldos azules en, el, en las casas, casas destruidas, tuvimos terremotos, hemos tenido sequía, hemos tenido ahora la pandemia, muchas situaciones. Así que, y seguimos de pie. Seguimos de pie porque tenemos esperanza dentro de todo. Así que yo creo que la diáspora nos ha, nos ha ayudado. Muchos puertorriqueños se, nos hemos tenido que ir, otros han vuelto. Eso es parte de, la, de, nuestra, de nuestra situación. Lo importante va a ser es ¿Cuál va a ser la postura del gobierno de los Estados Unidos con Puerto Rico? ¿Y qué va a pasar en un futuro? La relación política, esas decisiones yo todavía no sé. Pero por lo pronto hay que mantener una relación, hay que estar aquí, hay que comunicarse. Nosotros tenemos que ser parte de la diáspora. Todo lo que está pasando ahora with Black Lives Matter y todo este movimiento racial es importante. Nosotros tenemos que insertarnos ahí nosotros tenemos que participar junto con lo que están haciendo los African Americans. Recuerda que parte de la historia del African American Experience was based on the research done by Puerto Rican. Uh -huh. No sé si lo sabe. Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, el padre de, the de, father de, of Black History in this country, was a Black Puerto Rican. That's right. Arturo Schomburg. Estamos mezclados. Tenemos que estar mezclados con, la, con lo que está pasando en la nación americana. Y en Puerto Rico tenemos que estar más pendientes a lo que hacen los congresistas, lo que hacen los senadores y sobre todo todos estos latinos que están entrando ahora. Así que yo creo que tenemos que tener más atención a la política de los Estados Unidos y, y mutuamente. Creo que debería fomentarse ahora con, con hay unas esperanzas de que Puerto Rico empiece la reconstrucción. Yo creo que la, y, y yo esperaría que la diáspora tuviese una participación más activa que cualquier otro inversionista que venga del exterior. Porque qué mejor venir, que venga alguien de nosotros ayudarnos a levantar esto aquí. Así que yo creo que tenemos que trabajar juntos y mantener esa comunicación. Si lo hacemos en momentos familiares, ¿por qué Seguro no lo hacemos sí. político, verdad? That's right. Look what we did after Hurricane Maria. We, I mean, yeah. we, it was an incredible movement. And Sandra, you have our commitment here on Bob My Life. First of all, Sandra, we'd love for you to be our, our regular correspondent about Puerto Rican issues because we need voices like you to talk to teach the diaspora and Latinos around the country. A lot of things that have come out of watching this show are Latino friends around the country, especially in the West Coast, lo mexicano y lo hispano from California. They might know one or two Puerto Ricans and they see the celebrities, but they don't really know Puerto Ricans. And so mm -hmm. our intellectualism and our, our philosophies and our struggles. 
So this is a way to teach our Latino brothers and sisters about the totality of our issues. And you're teaching the Puerto Ricans que están aquí a, a lot of it, a lot of the things we need to know. So thank you yeah. so much. We're going to continue to have an open line of communications, brands of Puerto Rico. We've had a lot of Puerto Rican business people on the show this summer, how we can continue to invest in Puerto Rico. So we're working on this on a lot of levels. We had a lot of activists that are very interested in what you're doing and what you're reporting. So Sandra, explique how we can follow you on social media, how we can follow your reporting, your journalism, your analysis, and anything else you want to share in Lodo Yoma with the Bomba Life community. Yo estoy, eh, llevo un tiempo escribiendo en español, tengo que volver a hacer el switch a pensar en inglés, porque estoy pensando mucho en español, por eso se me ha hecho difícil hoy, pero voy a volver a escribir en inglés por mucho tiempo I was a reporter for Caribbean Business for many many years in Puerto Rico, so and I also have worked in the States and covered 9-11 and you know, other things in the past way back but anyway um, eh, yo creo que, que me pueden conseguir en Facebook por Sandra Rodríguez Coto en Twitter por SRC Sandra y yo creo que hay que estar pendiente. Hay, una, hay unos elementos puertorriqueños, además del desarrollo económico, importante nuestra cultura. Yo vivo en el mundo de las letras, con escritores, con autores, ese es mi, mi, mi mundo. Y, ve, y conozco a casi todo el mundo. Puerto Rico tiene de los mejores escritores del, de América Latina y del mundo. Lo que pasa es que no nos, desca, no nos destacamos. Y, y estamos muy cercanos a parte de nuestra de nuestros escritores, son los escritores que viven en Estados Unidos, puertorriqueños que viven allá. Así que tenemos que aprender nuestra cultura para preservarla. La única manera que tú de, eh, defiendes y entiendes lo que eres es aprendiendo tu cultura. Tienes que conocer tus raíces right. para poder caminar hacia adelante. Saber de dónde vienes para saber a dónde vas. Así que es mm -hmm. importante que la diáspora se eduque, que, que nos enseñe incluso a nosotros, porque a veces la diáspora sabe más que nosotros acá en la isla y que participemos juntos y conozcan a los nuevos artistas. Hay muchos jóvenes eh, exponentes más allá de reggaetón, hay muchos cantantes de reggaetón urbano eh, interesantísimos, muchos pintores, hay, hay escritores fabulosos, muchos poetas, eh, actores, hay que apoyarlos. Y yo, a mí me parece que es la única forma en que el pueblo, no, la, la cultura nos une, la música nos une, vamos a celebrar lo que nos une. La política, pues mira, lo trabajamos pero vamos a celebrar lo que nos une para poder movernos hacia adelante. Sandra, you made such a good point there about our accomplishments, and I wanted to, as we finish up this political conversation with Sandra Rodriguez Coto y Abraham Amoros on Bomba Live, Found Translation Simulcast, I wanted to shout out two Puerto Rican women that made political headlines the last few weeks. One is Zulma Lopez. Zulma Lopez is a Puerto Rican immigration attorney in Atlanta, Georgia, Abe, that just won a primary for Georgia State House in the Excellent. ACL, Boricua. And you talk about Puerto Ricans throughout the diaspora. The mayor of Wichita, Kansas, un saludo fuerte a Michelle de la Isla, the mayor of Amen. Wichita, Kansas, Boricua, who just won her primary for the second congressional district of Kansas. So you talk about Puerto Ricans making moves all over the country, all over the world. Yeah. Sandra Rodriguez Cotto, thank you so much. We're going to tell you to follow your work, support you 100%. Abe, a quick comment uh, before we let you go and uh, before we play our musical clip uh, to intro the next, the last segment of this episode of Bomba Live. It is important that we all organize, mobilize, and get out to vote on November 3rd. Make your voice count. Take away any excuses for them not including us. Seguro que sí. En un, un mensaje a nuestra congresista, el único boricua that's going to speak at the DNC, Rep. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, if you take 90 seconds, what are they going to say? So do your thing, girl. So, Sandra, no, Luis, minuto, gracias, mija. Abraham, we're going to play a clip from a performance from last week's episode, Ladies' Night episode with Dana Ree. Uh, the singer Dan Ari Boricua from New Jersey, a wonderful singer and activist. And then we're going to have Dionelli and La Molina talk a little bit about uh, uh, Perreo and some of the Musica Albano headlines here on Bomba Live. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Nobody even knows 
noticed I saw them standing right there Kinda thought they'd make it I had a dream I got everything I wanted But when I wake up I see You with me And you say As long as I'm here No one can hurt you Don't wanna lay here But you can learn to If I could change The way that you see yourself You wouldn't wonder why you're here They don't deserve Tried to scream, but my head was underwater. They call me weak, like I'm not just somebody's daughter. Could have been a nightmare, but it felt like they were right there. And it feels like yesterday was a year ago, but I don't want to let anybody know. Everybody wants something from me now And I don't want to let them down I had a dream I got everything I wanted Thank you, Dana Ray. And uh, we're going to continue to support that woman. She's not only a great talent, but a great activist. Let's bring on, you know, we love to talk politics here in the series business, but, you know, we got to catch up with the culture. And I got to give... We got to have this man on the show, the official Musica Urbano, Urbano correspondent for Bomba Live. The guy that keeps me in touch. What's going on in La Calle, Baba? La Monia back on Founding Church. Hey, lo que hay que hacer. What's up, Papi? Todo bien, todo bien. Tranquilo, Papi. Yeah, right. Nothing new, yo, man. Oh, man, I got tanto aliases, bro. A.K. Gabi, A.K. Juan Gonzalez, <laughs> A.K. Dionelli's bodyguard, <laughs> A.K. Planet Wingman. Hey. Got hey. Dr. Bird Chirp and a very talented artist, right? You know? What's going on, brother? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tranquilo, papi. Ya tú sabes, no hay más nada. Estamos, yes, estamos activos. Trabajando como siempre, you know. know you working on doing anything, making music. So. Yes, yes. We're coming out soon with some new stuff. So, you know me, I'm an R&B guy. So, you know, I try to bring that that American R&B flavor into the Spanish industry. The Onelia tell you, I had her crying. So, you know. She'll tell you how that works. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, well, you, you teased it because we couldn't have you back with that great segment that you did with Norris on our our, our opening Bomba Live sh- Spectacular and Mr. Yeah. Greens and all the, our friends in the, in, the, in the squad. Yes. But we had to bring back your label mate, your co-host, the Dominican princess of TikTok. Do you know? Hey, that's to a certain age level. I figure I'll keep it a princess, but there you go. I know. 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 I I got you. I got you. So, so look, I need y'all because I try to, I'm desperately trying to hold on to staying young. So what I do is I keep in touch with my youngsters to keep me in touch with what's going on in the Musica Albano scene. So there's a couple of topics I wanted to hit on. So first of all, Monia, Jolie Randi. I know a lot of your people work closely with them over the years. Yes, One of the yes, legendary yes. groups in the genre. Yep. Not only Very did they come good. out with a new album, but they came out with an international day of Perreo last week. So tell us about their new, their new, their new album, Vive Perreo, and why it's so important for the culture. So, so we're important. I'm going to tell you why it's so important. So we're going back to Perreo de Marquesina. You know, um, esta es la música de nosotros. En esto nosotros exploramos el mundo. You know, so cuando tiene que ver con Perreo, pues nosotros estamos marcados. Es un sello que nunca se va a ir. You know, so, you know, when that, with them, I'll leave it like this. So Bad Bunny opened that door again, you know, because obviously, you know, giving it to, you know, the, my, my Dominican people, you know, we, we kind of stepped back. We went into the trap and then, you know, the Dominicans started going in with the Dembo and all that. Mm-hmm. Bad Bunny Cream, he grabbed it. He said, hold up, let me get this back, brought it back in. 
And, you know, ever since that is just back, you know, it's becoming uh, the, the, the new new. It's like coronavirus, you know, is here. You know, it's not going it's nowhere. Not so. We had a lot, of, a lot of collaborations with El Alfa, with El Alfa, with them both. So they, they did a yes. lot together. So now yes. I feel and, and, like Dominicans and Puerto Ricans were no longer competing. We're coming together and collaborating, which, amen. you know, power in numbers. Yeah. Y una mezcla bien buena. So I, I think it's amazing. Um, well, yeah, th- this this word is has a very powerful connotation to the culture, to our language. Perreo. We're bringing Perreo back. Perreo. So, so explain to people, obviously there's a family program, but explain to people what that means and what, what Perreo and that, that part of our oh, culture man. is so significant. Break it down. We're school. I out there. We're teaching people. All right, so, so, I mean, here's, here's the thing. Down. There's so much, there's, there's so much to it. So of course, you know, when you talk about Perreo, you know, obviously it's all about grinding, man. It's, it's the streets. It, let's dancing. just be honest, you know, it's dirty dancing. That's what it is. It's the streets, you know, it's bringing that young person out of you because listen, let's, let's get it right. You got kids doing it and you, you got grandma and great, great grandma and great grandpa's doing it. You know, it, it brings out life in you. It brings out freedom. Um, you know, a, a free soul, basically you do what you want on that dance floor, you know, and it's dirty dancing, man. It's the forbidden dance. I feel like you know, for that, a while- that's what it is. For a while, reggaeton was like more like lovey dovey, more romantic, and I was getting back to like being more direct, like mm-hmm. um, yeah, a little bit more explicit. But I'm good. Like it get it gets more explicit now because obviously, as the years go by, you know, hablando claro, las palabras pues ya se usan más. Es más, es más. How can I say? It's okay to speak let's just say fresh, you know, because let, let's be honest before it was kind of beating around the bush with the words. Now it's more direct. So, you know, and, and let's just be honest. That's what people like is it's what they like now. Keep it realness, authenticity. It always that's works. It. You know, La Maria, tell us about Vivera Perreo, this new album, because, you know, it's hard to stay in the game and Jolie Randy, you know, they've been around for a minute. They've had their, they've had some classics, but there's a lot of competition out there. Cause you know, now, not just a Dominican artist or a Colombiano. They got a big niche. They're, they, some of their stars are as big as the biggest Puerto Ricans, the biggest Dominicans. And there's Latinos, man. I go, you can go on YouTube and spend hours just seeing La Musica Urbano in Brazil, Peru, Chile. There's a, Argentina. There's a lot of people doing interesting things out there. So tell us why this album, what's about this album brings Joel Hirandi back to the forefront? So, so I've had a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time with Joel Irandi in the past, you know, really good friends of mine. It's been a while. We kind of like, you know, parted our ways, but nothing bad, you know, it's just obviously work, family, busy, you know, man. yeah, really busy, but I've spent a lot of time with them. Genuine guys, man, very genuine, good people. Um, you know, what brings them back to this? Like, so is there, is there originality? Is is because of who they are makes them that makes the music that they create for the Puerto Rican and and the world, you know. But but the thing is, is that that they've always held on to that Puerto Rican style. They've never broken away from it. And and now that the doors have opened back up to their genre, like what they do, which is perreo, perreo de marquesina, it's 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 big for the island. It's big for our people because that's who we are. That's who we are. That's what, yeah, it's, it's what we, it's what we created for the world. And it, and like Dionelli said, we kind of broke away for that for a while. You know, we went into lovey dovey, que si te amo, que si, yeah, Lennox, Lina, you the know, papi chulo, yeah, the you know, yeah, yeah. So now Ese we're como back que pasó to, con salsa in the 80s, con la balada, it used to be salsa dura with Fanny and all that, and Hector Lavo and all those guys. Then it went into a, uh, a, a romantic period. With some material yes. we got out of, but yeah, what were you gonna say, yeah. Dianelli? Something I like about uh, Viva el Perreo uh, with this, the, the album. There's 14 tracks and it includes one of the songs is Anaranjado, which is in collaboration with J Balvin, who's Colombian. So it's like, as Latino artists, we're no longer looking at each other as competition. It's like, how can we collaborate? How could we come together? How could we grow together? And I think that's beautiful. I'm going to ask you about a couple of these guys coming up. I want to get your thoughts on La Armonia. We're talking to my great friends, some of my, my, uh, some of my people that keep me my ear to the street, La Armonia, my great, one of my young boys, shout out to our, my brother, Plan Terry, who brought us together, and Dionelli Reyes, one of my great co-hosts here on Bomba Live, found in translation. 
when I asked Dionelli to come on, say, hey, we got to give people an update on the music, Urbano scene, she goes, you know, I got to bring my Dominican Dominican rap beef to the table. They got the ears popping, whether it's Washington Heights, Providence, North Philly, Allentown, all my Dominican hood. We're everywhere. So I know, I know you are. Trust me, I'm aware. Um, and, uh, but so it turns out two of the biggest Dominican rappers in the game, Morta La Parra y, y Lapis Consciente, got a beef going on on that Nas Jay Z level. So tell us what's going on and tell us why this beef is so important with these two figures in, in Dominican rap right now. So for you guys that I don't know if you haven't heard of them, you've been living under a rock. Mosa La Para, he is signed to uh, Jay-Z's Rock Nation, the Latin division. So he's a big deal. OK. And um, El Lapi Consciente, he's a Grammy nominated artist. So Lapi Consciente, he likes to keep it on the ground. He has done a little bit of them both, but he's like a he's like focused on being a legit rapper. El Papa del Rap is what um, they know him as. So he basically started, he became really popular around like 2005, 2006. And then Mosa La Para came along. Like, I don't know if you guys remember, Yo Tenia Un Sapito, Pero Me Lo... Do you remember that song? Well, I know a lot of, a lot of people watching that. <laughs> he has a lot of songs. He has a lot of great, great, great songs after that. It was like, like the main one, the big, you know... He came on afterwards, but then now Mosa La Para is doing more like mainstream music where um, La Piconciente has kept it more like underground, like true to his roots type of thing. So then there's been, there's three rounds already of this battle rap. So the first one, um, Golpe de Estado, that's Mosa started it. So he, and then um, El Lapi responded with Tu Nota, but that one, Mosa won. And every, everybody's like, what's going on? So uh, Lapi Consciente, his followers are called Lo Lapicista. E, and the followers, um, Mosa, um, Mosa La Para's followers are Mosarista. So the, what, which, which, which side are you on? Uh, come to find out. I am Lapicista. I, I thought for a while that I was Mosarista until. <laughs> so wait, let me explain when I realized this. So then the second round came and then um, game over was Mosa. Mosa's part, and then Nueve Dia was the Lapi's part. So that second round, on that part, Mosa won again, and I was kind of feeling bad. And then I was just like, "Um, we should just call it a truce. Like, what's going on? <laughs> like, everybody's like, what's going on with Lapi? We want to see old school Lapi. Like, what's happening? So then Mosa came back again with El Papa de Lapi, and he there he got personal. So there, um, like before he was just um, telling Lapi, like, you still haven't been international. Like, nobody really knows you. And then um, Lapi was basically saying, like, oh, well, um, you've gone. You're fake now. You're a clown. You're just doing mainstream music now, blah, blah, blah. Like, it was all like, la, da, da, whatever. But Mosa was winning. But then Mosa, in this third round with El Papa de Lapi, he got personal. With the verse, he says, A veces me da pena con Palin porque cada vez que respondo, ella saca el botiquín. So in, in English, that means I feel bad for Palin because every time I respond to you, she has to take out the like medicine cabinet like to cure your, your wounds. Palin is his grandmother. His grandmother raised him. Like, oh, that's deep. That. that is <laughs> heavy. That's deep. Armonia, what you think about this battle, brother? Do you agree with this? I mean, you know? so, and I'll tell you the response. So people. I've listened to a little bit of it. Um, See, I was under the impression because of what Mozart was saying. He was saying that El Lapi was the one that started getting personal first. And that's why he kind of went into getting personal with him. He's like the only, you know, from, from the interview I watched on it, he said, uh, he said something about like, yo, the only reason why he thinks he's going to beat me is because now he's getting disrespectful. Oh, yeah. After after Lapi's response to that Pauline situation where he mentioned him, then Lapi like barrio con él, like lo bato. Like even the, the music video that Lapi had for him, um, which is it's called... The one at the cemetery? Yeah, the one in the cemetery. Yeah. That one. El Descanso Eterno. That one is where he like killed him. Like everybody just went crazy. That's when I realized like Oh my God, he's back! Resucito, el lapi is back. Like I got so excited. I'm like, let me find out. I'm lapicita all this time. Like I remember, oh I remember back in the day, lapis. I mean, I I used to listen to him, 
And I'm trying to remember who was he coming at, but he's always kind of been in a battle rap thing. Yeah. You know, um, and I think it was with um El Alpha, if I'm right. It might have been Alpha, it might have been somebody else, but I know he had a big battle with somebody, like I'm talking maybe yeah, 10 years I'm ago. Yeah, I mean, he is always trying to battle somebody. Throughout like right. Dominican <laughs> urban music, like rappers, like El Alpha is like the if not the best, one of the best. So if you want to like tirale a alguien, you tú le tira to the best. Of course. But you know who to who to respond to, you know what I mean? So the one what burned him. Mosa was um, when El Api said, un hombre que le, que le ofendieron a su hija y no hizo nada. Because he's trying to say, like, tú eres el papá del papá. Pero un hombre que le ofendieron a su hija y no hizo nada. Because there was this communicator, Enrique Crespo, who was talking, you know, disrespectfully about his daughter. And Mosa didn't respond to him. And then he also said, um, lo besaron de princesa y sigue siendo rana. So rana is like that you're like trash, basically. Like Right, the and words, he yeah. like his ex-wife, and then supposedly Mosa had an affair, yeah. and then he left his wife for the one he's with now. So he's getting really personal. And then he said, "Ex mujer se busca más que tú." I get to see. He also said, "Un verdadero papá no desbarata su familia." Like it's just like a bunch of stuff. It's getting really personal. It's the end of the third round. I think it's, it should just end here. I think so. Too. <laughs> it just starts know. getting too personal, then other people get involved. That's. That's where it gets bad, you know, because let's just face it. When it's tira era and when it's stuff like that, you got friends and your friends got friends and it starts getting personal. People DR involved. small dog. It's the same three or four yeah. spots people are partying at in Santo Domingo and Puerto Plata. And, and before right. you know it, you run into each other. That's when things can pop off. We don't want to have no. They have a really strong following and each have very loyal following. Oh, yeah. So, we don't want to the get Yankees, Red Sox, polarized the, game, the whole the country. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so no I doubt. It'd be great if you just they just end it there. You know? Okay. And you know, I think Dionella, you should be the peacemaker. I think you should reach yes, out. To them. We I could don't. do it here. We could have a we could have a a a, a breaking of bread here and grab some brugal and cigars and that's a cabo, right? Say, go look and see. We can do it together. I'm on my life. We're gonna the first two rounds, and at the end, Vino Lapi knocked him out. But like, come on, guys, that's enough. What is, how many rounds is it going to go? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I agree. We're talking to the Onelli Reyes and La Armonia about the Musical Albano scene here at Bomba Live. Let, let's, let's give a Dominican woman a little love. La Armonia, since we have the Onelli here, the Dominican queen of Bomba yeah. Live and TikTok and Instagram and, you know, so many titles. La Armonia is not the, the biggest female in the game. I think she is, right? Nati is, well, right now. So you have, I I'm mean, saying this, today. I'm saying today. Today. Not historically. So you, if, if we're going to go platform completely, yes. Okay. Now, I'm going to, Dionelli, I have to do this. Yeah, we're I have to do it. I'm going to take credit. My, we got Puerto Rico got to take some credit for that. Of course. We, we got to yeah. take some credit for that because yeah. we have adopted her. We have adopted her. Even Puerto Rico, right? She lives in Yes. Canada. Listen, cool. let's be honest. She's married to Rafi Pina. Let's be, yeah, let's be honest. I mean, that's so yeah. obvious, isn't it? Isn't Rafi have Dominican now, too? I don't know. I think Rafi's still Puerto he's, Rico, nah. Yeah, I think it's that. Rafi's Puerto Rico. Rico. I check, look it up, bro. Okay, you ask her, when anyway. you ask her, so how are you and Rafi Pina? Are you guys together? You know it's a yes or no answer. She gives like this 15-minute answer. They're <laughs> very <laughs> private about their relationship. They're it's very private about it. Yeah. Yeah. But I will say she is, she is right now, you have a lot of girls that are coming up. I mean, you got Catalina. She's Puerto Rican. She's popping. She is um, popping. You know, you got a lot of a lot of people coming up, even in La Republica, a lot of Dominican uh, girls that are coming up right now. You know, um, but if I had to say across the platform, if there's one female that's definitely the most one that's popping, it's definitely going to be Nati. And the thing is, this is why I tell my Dominicans that, look, you know, all these guys we're talking about, these Dominican rappers, you know, they all got their niches. But when you go West Coast, you talk to the Latinos out West, Nati's the biggest Dominican by far. You oh, yeah. know, that's who people know. That's the most mainstream person. You know, so got to give love to Nati Natasha. Dionelli, we need to get Nati on the show. The two of us, the three of us need to break bread with the queen, the other queen. <laughs> no, the happy Pina, I'd have to prepare for weeks for that interview. That would be the, that's a bucket list moment, bro. Dímelo, prima. Venga al programa. Exacto, exacto. Ahí, le, ahí sí que le sale lo, lo, la, la de lo dominicana. Ah, exacto. A Nati. Give me another, either, either a song coming out or an artist you're keeping your eye on. In the so, scene, bro. Artists, artists that I'm keeping my eye on. 
Uh, um, besides myself, of course, of course. Um, it's definitely going to be Nordis, man. Nordis got a lot of great things that's happening right now. Um, you know, he's he's been in the scene for a long time, kind of like myself, set back for a little bit. Um, but Nordis has been with all the greats, man. I mean, we're talking, we're seeing Yandel, Sione Lennox. He's got mm -hmm. music out with Lennox. You know, Joel e. Randi. Obviously, Mr. Green's my guy. You know, that's my brother. Respect, um, same as yeah. no, so, so, same as Norris is my brother. You know, but he's got a lot of stuff coming out right now. He just dropped another song called Un Ratito Mas. Um, he's got um, Anomalia coming out, I believe, in a month, which is the whole album. Um, so definitely, if you guys are out there, look for Norris online. He's on YouTube, Spotify, on everything. Definitely drop in and check out his music because... The guy's definitely good. He's he's hitting hard right now. No, and it's hard because there's so much competition out there. Oh yeah, and it's like you said. It's about all the platforms. Your music mm -hmm. got to be tight. Your social media, you gotta you gotta get fans. And and Norris is good at this. I see with his IG lives and stuff. You got to get oh, yeah. fans. All of you, you know, you got to give them a lot of time and a lot of insight mm -hmm. about your career. Do you Nelly tell people about your new show, Aprendis Live, um, which you have on Sundays? Let people know about it. And now we can support all your platforms and your and your new Thank show. Thank you. Well, you could see my show on my Facebook page. Um, Transmitimos en vivo is in Spanish. Eh, Aprendiz Live is focused on it's like filosofía moderna, like modern philosophy. Where I know a lot of people wish they could attain the wisdom that comes from reading uh, certain books but they don't really like to read or they don't really like to read by themselves. So what we do is we have a book, like we take a, one book at a time and we do a few shows with that book and we read, a, you know, we read through the book and we pause and we reflect and then you could leave your comment um, about your thoughts about that part or la reflexión tuya and we share it on the show. So you're part of the show, it's international. Um, I do the show with my friend Miguel He's in Dominican Republic, so it's it's just amazing. He, this came out because of the whole um, quarantine and the pandemic. So we, it's a great time to think. Like we gotta look at the silver lining in every situation. Is it, I mean, you're sitting at home, you're having more time at home away from, you know, you can't go to the club, you can't really go to restaurants that much. You're at home. It's a great time to reflect, to read, and just to think. So that's what the show's about. But in these live, we uh, transmitimos en vivo on Sundays at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on my uh, Facebook uh, Facebook page, Dionelli ETC. You could also see it on YouTube, Dionelli ETC. And remember to follow me on Instagram, Dionelli ETC. ETC. Well, if you're not following Dionelli on social media, why on social media? But uh, <laughs> Monia, let us know where we can find your social media, brother. Any other shout outs yeah. you want to say about what's going on for you? Yes, yes, definitely La Almonia um, with double A at the end, um, all together. Um, and uh, just got a lot of new music that's going to be coming out within the month. Um, I'm working with a lot of people, Mr. Greens, of course, Norris. Um, and, you know, we got a lot of good, you know, not all slow. Dionelli will tell you who yeah, she's heard. Let me tell you. He made me cry. Like, you need to warn people. I like, know, like, well, guys got still. <laughs> He you know, the music of Bono corresponded for nothing. He's a very <laughs> tough. You just cool. sent me the, the link. I think it was a link or something. You sent it to me. And, I it to and I'm like, oh my God, wait, I have to stop it. I'm like, my eyes, like I'm crying. Down the couch. I mean, oh, yeah, everything is amazing. You're so. Well, I met him. You're super mega talented. Like you when, the music you, moves you. You, when the music moves you, you know it's great music. Thank you, thank you. When well, I met him in the hip hop scene with my brother Mario, and then he realized he's in he's in all these genres. So very talented guy. No, no. Hip hop, all all like around. That. Yeah, I try to I, like I try that. to give a, a lot of different, um, you know, just a lot of different styles. I'm not one person that I like to keep the same music. Just you know, I like to be different, versatile, you know, and keep keep it, you know, for everybody. I like to make music for the young crowd. I like to make music for the older crowd. I like to make the music for the girls that like to cry and, and or make them cry either way. But, you know, of course, that's that's what we do, you know. And, and you know, so definitely keep an eye out for that. It's coming out soon. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's really it, man. That's what we got going on right now. 
Wonderful. Dionelli Reyes, you know, you're a big part of the family here. We can support all your projects, and you're always going to be a big part of Bomba Live and Found Translation. La Maria, one of my young boys. You know, we're going to support you in all your endeavors, and and thank we you, need to you. bring, let's start booking Norris and Mr. Let's, we want to keep these conversations about the yeah. culture coming on, man. So of course, I man, have, you let me know. I want to have these artists on the show and Dionelli, and we got to keep these conversations about the culture and 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 let people know, like, there's, there's so it's so deep. You can study these music artists from Puerto Rico, the Maker Republic all day. And those are the, young, they're the ones that our young people are listening to. So the more we listen to these artists, the more we're going to understand our community. Thank you all so much. We're going to take out the show. We're listening to a little bit more of our friends in La Palcha. Have a wonderful weekend. Si vivo Puerto Rico and you didn't get to vote Sunday. Epa, epa. Vote Sunday. Y siga adelante familia. Bye. Hay amores que no pasan de una noche Aparecen y se pierden como gotas en el mar Hay amores en silencio que se esconden Por creer que es un pecado amar en plena libertad Yo tengo suerte de tenerte en esta vida De que sales cada herida con los besos que me da. Porque este amor me devolvió la luz del sol Y me ha llenado el corazón de primavera Y las ilusiones nuevas Este amor que me salvó en la soledad Sin condiciones para dar la vida entera No voy a dar de mil maneras tanto amor Mil maneras voy a adorar Quedo corto ya para poder pagarte Estaba perdida y me encontraste Con esa luz de tus ojos al mirarme Ya no quiero a nadie más Este amor que tú me das me basta para vivir Por eso te quiero decir que este amor Me devolvió la luz del sol Y me ha llenado el corazón de primavera Y tantas ilusiones nuevas Este amor me devolvió la luz del sol y me ha llenado el corazón de primaveras y tantas ilusiones nuevas. Este amor que me salvó en la soledad.